Hi, Kathy. Thanks so much for joining me today on the Financial Planner Life podcast. Um, You're very welcome. Cool. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm um, back I'm in the nice. office. Costa's reopened, so, you know, happy days. Happy days. Big Costa fan, big coffee fan. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's needed. <laughs> Where I live, I've got this, um, this guy, he's got this little hatch sort of cre- crepery and um, sells, yeah. um, sells coffees, and he's kept open the whole, of, um, the whole of lockdown, so I've literally been keeping him in business. So, uh, do you know, we've got one called Hatch, actually, in Darlington, and yeah, the same, just there every day. And, you know, you, not just because I've got coffee addiction, I'm doing my bits to local businesses. Absolutely, same. And actually, they're um, fair play to them. I think a lot of these little Hatch ones have done quite well. There's a few little yeah. ones around Bristol, so fair play to them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for joining us on the Financial Planner Life podcast today. Um, really excited to have you as a guest on the, on the podcast. I mean, you're somebody that has a um, significant footprint in the financial planning supporting functions area of financial advice and um i've not had anybody on the podcast yet really from a background of of power planning or compliance or outsourcing so it'd be really interesting to learn more about your journey and i think it'll be interesting for um anybody who's you know currently a power planner and perhaps thinking about going outsourcing and um and to hear your journey really and and your story so um thank you for joining us so um you know the, the the first well, we won't ask any questions about COVID-19 and lockdown at this stage. I think we've done that to death, haven't we? So um, we'll move on from uh, that. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're back <laughs> I think we're all ready to move on from it, yeah. We're all ready to move on from it. So, um, you know, the first question I always ask uh, one of my guests is really is, I'm, I'm really interested in finding out how you got into the industry. So can you sort of give me a little bit of an overview of how you got into the financial planning industry? Yeah, of course. Um so I guess everybody always, and I mean everybody that I speak to, I'm sure you see the same, they always say that they fell into financial services, um, which is you know, a separate story I guess in itself, that people rarely choose finance as a career, they just seem to end up in it. Um, I think mine was similar in the sense that um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left college. I was working at Royal Mail at the time, I worked at the post office for six years actually. Um, and I just thought I've had enough of studying, I don't want to go to university, I'll um, carry on working here and figure out what I want to do. And about six months later, really regretted it, decided that, you know, I need to get to university to do something. So I did, um, I'd done business in college and I loved business studies, but I thought I'm kind of a bit, a bit sick of that, I actually really like reading. So I just did English with a, um, like an English major and then a minor in business, um, which was good because it meant that I was doing something that I enjoyed. Um, you know, actually just got to read for my degree, which was amazing, and carried on working at Royal Mail the whole way through. Then got to the end of my degree and just thought, right, now what 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 do I do with six years Royal Mail experience and an English degree? Um and I had a boyfriend at the time and his ex girlfriend, she'd just received an inheritance of a hundred thousand pound. Um and I remember him saying, Oh, you know, she's received this inheritance and she's gone to speak to a financial advisor to see what to do with it. And hundred thousand pound this is what god how old am I now 15 16 years ago um yeah I mean it's a big amount of money now it was huge back then it was kind of mind-blowing to think that somebody in their early 20s had received a hundred thousand pound and I just thought what I, I literally just had absolutely no idea where where you would begin what the advisor would say to her you know I'd never even heard of an answer so there was just you know you're a young person you've got hundred thousand pounds you're going to see an advisor what does that look like what do you do yeah. Um, and it just really, really piqued my interest. It made me realise that there was a massive area um, that I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, nobody around me knew anything about it either. Um, and again, back in the day, this is before you know you had your business, so I, the only way to find a job was to look through the local paper. And there was a little yeah. advert in the paper for <laughs> being an administrator in a financial advice firm that wasn't too far away. Yeah. Um, so I applied for that and... Um, kind of talked my way into it because I did want somebody with advice but I guess I kind of sat in the interview and said I, I already feel really passionate about this thing even though I don't know what it is and you know and I could kind of throw myself at it and um, I just need somebody to give me a chance which they did um, and the reason I say it's interesting you know so people fall into finance I guess I kind of did in the sense that I didn't have a lifelong burning ambition before then to get into financial services years later I did um, this coaching course where they try and draw out of you um, your leadership skills and how you've actually got to where you are and something that and they go right back to kind of your childhood and the things that formed you and actually what came out of that was that 
ending up in finance maybe wasn't as random as I thought and people maybe don't fall into finance as much as they think they do um the the result that we got to was that um growing up in a poor family and having no money meant that there was something inherent in me that I wanted to understand finance and I wanted control of my own future and then that's actually translated into a career in finance um so yeah partly fell into it partly look of an ex-boyfriend's ex-girlfriend and partly apparently just you know has been building up over years and years and years so okay cool so just kind of a recap there then so you were at university you were you, you were studying um whilst working at the the royal mail um so no interest in, in, in finance at that stage. There was no burning desire to become, you know, a financial advisor or to learn about the financial you know, services or anything along those lines. No. Quite, typ- quite typical then, you finish your degree, you've done an English degree. Yes. Quite, quite typical then, you, you know, you finish it and you're thinking, well, what, what, what next? What am I going to do? Um, you've, you've heard somebody talking about a large sum of money that they're looking to invest. And that's made you think, well, what, how does that money get invested? Where does it mm-hmm. go? Who, who, who's going to do this? And that then got you onto the, the mindset of thinking, well, what does a financial advisor do? So that kind of little drop into your mind then really sort of opened up the world of financial planning. So you, yeah. you, you approached, um, so when you went out there to then, as a, as a graduate, you went out there to, to find a job opportunity. It's funny that you mentioned the newspaper because I remember opening you know, the newspaper up in the Evening Post, for example, and you'd go through it and you'd, you'd, you know, you'd literally be job adverts in there on a Thursday. Yeah, yeah. So classic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we found we found one in the office actually a little while back. It's, it's quite it's quite weird. It's really weird. I mean, as recruitment Scary consultants, how much it's as recruitment consultants as well, you would order it, you know, and you know all the newspapers and circle them and phone the companies up. Absolutely, like yeah. You know that was how you. Did and like, is even the fact that it was only on a Thursday as well? Like, if you didn't have a job, you had to wait a full week until you could yeah. see if there was any others. It's just yeah. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? I I remember when like even emailing your CV out to people was like, wow, cool. That's a really novel <laughs> yeah. way, way, way of doing I'm, it. Barely sure I posted mine. I don't think I had an email. <laughs> yeah, posting exactly. It's mad, isn't it? It's, it's, it has the, the world of recruitment and how companies hire is, is has has massively changed, and um, yeah, we can kind of talk about that a, a, a little bit later as well because I know that you're a you know a keen advocate of taking on graduates. But you know, you joined this financial planning firm. Now, when you went through the process and and, and you started up, so when you, what did you start as in this financial planning firm? Did you start as an administrator, or did you? Yes, you know, yeah, yep. an administrator. Yeah. Okay, and that was um, for- and. It was, yeah, it was, so it was a small financial, I wouldn't say planning at the time, it was a financial advice firm. Yeah. Um, they were in Bishop Auckland, so about 15, 20 minute drive from where I was in Darlington. And they were very much um, just, you know, how financial advice firms were at the time. It was a number of male um, middle-aged financial advisors Classic. and a number of um, female support staff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, there was a lot of investment bonds going around it was you know it was kind of it just was what finance was at the time um and yeah so I went in as an administrator um I was the administrator to the MD who was kind of it was his company he was the main business writer um so it was kind of a, a bit of a mixed role of doing general financial services admin so new business processing and dealing with clients and back office systems um but then also a bit of sort of general pa work for him and sort of managing his diary and, and everything like that um you know post opening there was a, a rotor for taking your turns open in the post and you had to block out hours every so often to stay back on a night and do all the filing because everything was paper based. We used to put a lot of the files down in the cellar in a different building a few doors down the street. Um, I mean, it just sounds like decades ago, doesn't it? I'm yeah. not that old. <laughs> so, well, so it much, wasn't that long ago. So much, yeah, well, you, so much has changed. And um, interestingly enough, so much has changed, but I, there are a huge amount of advisors out there and, and companies that still are paper based, that still yeah, do things yeah. very old school. Um, yeah. You know, I, I remember somebody asked if they could fax an invoice a while back, and we were just like, "What? What are you on about? <laughs> no, you can't fax me an invoice. <laughs> what the hell's a fax machine? Stop it." <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, okay, cool. So you were sort of baptism of fire then, moving into like the financial advice world was was being an administrator, general um, PA by the sounds of it as well, to a to, to a director, I suppose, was yeah. out there selling products, product selling, yep. you know, and um, yeah. you know, and you were you were calling up sort of companies and getting valuations in and all that kind of stuff chasing it up do you think that starting in an administration position when moving into the world of financial advice do you think that's a really good route into a financial advice company absolutely i think um 
I just I think with anything that you do you can skip levels and try and sort of backfill but it's never it's never quite as good the depth isn't there I think with absolutely any any element of your life if you go in and you get the foundations and you build up then where you end up will be so much more robust um, and that's absolutely the case in financial services they're you know dealing with insurance companies and even now they are still around all the old products are still around understanding the intricacies kind of even just understanding i got a good grip on how regulation was working and how it used to work just by the products that i was doing the admin on so you know dealing with section 32s or all dtps and all of these things i would then need to understand how the rules used to be in order to understand how those products came to exist in order to know what that looked like in comparison to today's world so it's not as simple as admin and i think even when we've tried to recruit for people in my firm and it's it's around data gathering and getting plan information. If you describe it as admin, it's massively um, underselling it because actually it's much, much more complex than that. It's not faxing or photocopying or kind of doing day to day things. There's there's a lot of knowledge that you need to build up and it does. It just gives you a really good sort of grounding in in finance and then you can kind of build up from there. Nice grassroots level sort of introduction Absolutely. to what's going on, learning and understanding the terminology and the requirements, time scales, how to, you know, how to work with these external providers as well and, and different yeah. um, different places. Okay, cool. So how long were you doing that role for out of interest? Well, how long was I doing that role for? Um, the majority of the time that I was there, I think, um, because so basically when I'd gone in, I'd thought, okay, I want to be a financial advisor. Okay, that was your um, goal. Well, I wanna, does. Yeah, you wanted to yeah, be a financial you know, advisor. I've heard about being a financial advisor. That's something that I want to do. Yeah. Um, and then when I got in there, because it was a traditional selling firm and they all had targets and they were very um, serious about their targets, there was a lot of pressure on people to sell a bond um if you needed to to hit your target that month it put me off i just thought, actually i don't that's not what i want to do in the slightest um i'm really enjoying what i'm doing i'd started to do my qualifications it was certificate in financial planning back then and um, i did that then i started on the diploma um so i was really kind of enjoying the finance part of it i really didn't want to get into being a, a pension salesman or a bond salesman um so i'd come across this role of a power planner i'd read about it and kind of pushed and pushed and pushed to say i want to be a power planner um sorry my zoom's just doing funny messages so i'm hoping it's right, out. um and it, it, they they did the thing of kind of going yeah sure we'll we'll call you a power planner they gave me kind of a made-up job title and um, it wasn't power planner it was you know senior administrator or something um, and said, and, and you know, there's an extra thousand pound a year on your salary. And now you're a power planner, but also can you just carry on doing what you were doing? Um, which was the point that I'd, I'd started to look around. So I think I was there for about four years altogether. Um, so but it was a really good grounding, but it was, yeah, I, without being able to actually progress my career, then there was there was no point staying much longer. Was this pre or post RDR? Oh, it was pre. I got. I went through RDR there. I think. Let me think. So I started there in 2005. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. 2005. Okay, cool. Yes, it was. Yeah. So yeah, and because then I started at another firm at the end of 2008. So yeah, probably about three and a half years there, and then it was 2009 um, that I left and started my own business. Yeah. So so in, in essence, really, they wouldn't have really kind of understood what the role of a power planner was no. and the value of what a power planner will add, especially post no. RDR. Um, you had sort of sounds like you had a bit of a foresight there at that stage to start to see the role of a power planner. Um, you've been doing you were doing your research and looking around and sort of thinking, well, that's the route that I want to go down. Interesting that you wanted to become a financial advisor, but were put off by mm. the, the, the higher pressure sort of sales targets that were in place back then. Do you think if it was now and you just started your career, do you think the changes that have happened post RDR would have changed your mind about being a financial advisor, do you think? Is it, is it less salesy, do you think, or not? It is. Um, it is. It absolutely is. Um, yeah, RDR had a big impact on that. And I think, you know, any business has targets. You, you, you're you mm. a business. You know, my business has targets. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with aiming for a level of sales. Um, you know, you need to project. You need to create turnover. You need to have profit. That's the only way you can get staff and you can grow and you can do your service. 
Um, I think back then it was just the extreme. It was kind of the sales came above anything else. Um, and obviously because it was pre-RDR, because commission was built into the product, you know, they didn't see that there was anything wrong with quickly churning a bond um, because it was costing the client nothing. Um, so I think in the current world it is very different and I think people do still have targets, but that's fine. It's just to encourage activity and to get people out. Um, do I think it would change whether I want to be an advisor? Yes, in the sense that I wouldn't have been put off by the lack of sales, but I'm now put off being an advisor, being an advisor by the regulation. Um, so actually, I, I still wouldn't want to get into that advisor world. I'd still prefer being on the support side, but for different reasons. Okay, cool. So, you know, a question I definitely want to ask you then is, so why did you choose to um, go down the support route as opposed to the financial planning route? Why did you, be, you know, choose to become a power planner instead of a financial advisor? Um, so I'd seen the power planner role. I can't remember how, how I came across it back in whenever it was 2005. Um, but I had come across it. I was just really enjoying my studies. I, I, you know, I worked long hours at that firm. You, you just kind of work seven till seven. That was the default. And then you'd go home and study. And um, I was new in my career. And, you know, you're just thirsty for knowledge and you're just, you're learning and you're soaking it up and you're really enjoying it. And um, I'd got to the point where I could do my day job with my eyes closed. I needed more hours in the day because we were so busy, but actually it didn't challenge me. Whereas I could see that the power planning role would, that I could take all this knowledge that I was learning and build something up every day. And actually start to apply it. I could see how it would add value to the advisor. Um, I could just see how we could do a much better job for the clients. And uh, when I moved to the next firm that I went to, they did understand the role of a power planner. They were actually um, way ahead of RDR. They were different in how they charged clients. They did, um, you know, financial plans. They did cash flow. And um, they had a power planner already. They were looking for another one. So it gave me the that experience it made me go actually no this is what i thought it could be this is something where personally i'm feeling quite fulfilled because i'm getting to do all of this technical stuff and all this information and learning and actually apply it to my career um and then yeah from that point i think i'd already been put off advising and just found that i, I could really get my teeth stuck into power planning and then was just quite happy to kind of keep power planning just not at that firm no, fair enough. Um, interesting, actually, because I think that's a classic s s scenario, really, you see even now is that somebody's working for a company, their job title is power planner, but actually they're not power planners. They're not yeah. doing a true power planning role. And if anything, they are an administrator being given a power planning title and perhaps a pay rise. Yeah. Um, and I always sort of challenge people in the the role with the job title of power planner to explain to me what actually it is they do to yeah. consider themselves a power planner and more often than not that challenge comes back with you know an answer that it's like you're not a power planner you know yeah, what you're doing yeah. right now is is, is 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 not true power planning so you obviously felt that when you were in that role you looked at this new company they'd already had a power planner in place and established the role of a power planner were they a fee based firm then at that stage they were, well? yeah yeah okay yeah. so yeah it didn't really suit the kind of commission based type type outfit did it power planner it wasn't it wasn't really like um it wasn't a service really that, that there was no no it was just like i could say a glorified administration yeah absolutely perfect okay great so um all right so you were working for that company you left the first firm got into the, you know, got into the industry via an administration route, very typical. Yeah. Um, still very quite difficult for some people to actually get into the administration role, but you know, you talk your way into it by the sounds of it, very convincing. Um, <laughs> the then you move, then you thought to yourself, great, don't want to be a financial advisor. Not for me. I want to be a fat power planner. I want to be support. I'm doing my qualifications. I'm learning a lot about the industry and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm really enjoying that side, the learning side of it. And then the research and everything that goes with power planning obviously tick, tick some boxes for you. You found yourself a new job. You know, you stepped into the role of a power planner, a true power planning role. And um, how long were you there in that role for then? Eight months. Eight months. Mm. So a short time then. Why was that? Um, a mix of things. So they, that film was down in Harrogate, um, which meant quite a commute for me from Darlington there and back every day, which I wasn't enjoying and couldn't really afford. And um, petrol was just crazy expensive at the time. Um, and also I, it was a small firm and I didn't really get on with the advisors in the end. Um, there was just quite a big personality clash between me and them. Um, 
but yeah, it was kind of the driver to go, okay, well, I do enjoy power planning. Um, I did, they were actually quite key, I guess, to shaping a lot of what I've done in power Souls in the end, because what had happened with that firm was I'd interviewed with them initially. Um, obviously I'd applied, I'd interviewed, we'd done like a Myers-Briggs or some sort of personality test. Um, I'd then done another interview. I'd then gone down to the office and met some of the team. So it was a really, really, really thorough um, interview process. It was really kind of hard to get the job. And when I left and I handed my notice in at the first place, the the boss there, the MD, who wasn't very happy with me leaving, people generally don't seem to be very happy when you decide yeah. to leave. No. Um, <laughs> He, he was kind of full of caution and saying, oh, you know, be careful. It mightn't be the firm that you think it is. And, um, you know, have you looked on company's house to see if they're even secure and solvent? And, and I just was like, yeah, you know, you just, you're just being bitter. It's great. It's great. Doing his best to um, you off. Yeah, exactly. And I went and literally within a week, I just thought, oh, yeah, this isn't the firm that I thought it was. And they've done a very good job of selling themselves to me um, during the recruitment process. And I've been so busy trying to sell myself to them and I'm so kind of inexperienced in this recruitment hiring game that I don't know what else to do, but actually it's not, it's not the company that I thought it was. Um, just in the sense that it wasn't right for me, you know, it's kind of still going and they've got employees and they're all happy and, and so on and so forth, but absolutely it, didn't, it, it wasn't right for me. And it's shaped a lot of what I do now when I hire people in my company, I never want them to leave a firm to come and join my firm and to then go, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't the business that I thought it was. Um, so I make quite a big point of saying that you're interviewing us just as much and it's not a lip service thing. Like I've, I've been there, I've done it. I've made that leap and then thought, oh God, what have I done? Um, and I also get them to come in and do a trial, even for kind of a few hours or a day and say, I can tell you, you know, until I'm blue in the face that my company is amazing, but of course I'm going to think that it's mine. Come in, sit in the office, feel the environment, speak to the people, see what it's like, because I'd rather you decided now at this stage, if it's not right for you, than you make the leap, you quit a current role, you come and join us and then kind of regret it. Mm. Um, so yeah, it didn't work for me. Um, and that's fine because it gave me the push ultimately to start my own business and also then shaped the way that I have kind of recruited and, and brought people on myself. Oh, great. So, okay, great. You, you know, you are a business owner. You've set up the Verve Group, which is a group of a group of companies, and we're going to sort of break that down and have a look at each of those areas of your business, why you set it up, and um, you know what, what those what those individual businesses actually do. Um, just prior to that, really, you know, mm. it's not 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 everybody sets up their own business. You know, everyone leaves university, becomes an administrator in a financial planning firm you know, does their qualifications, has a stint in power plan and then decides, do you know what, I'm going to set up a, set up a business. I'm going to build a, you know, an empire. Why did you do that? You know, why, why did you choose to leave employment and set up your own business? Um, why did I? <laughs> um, do you know what? It's one of those things. I don't know if you felt it. I, I think if I'd overthought it at the time, I mightn't have, um, you know, I, I, there was a huge amount of naivety on my part. Um, I was younger. I didn't have a child like I have now, so you can kind of make different decisions. I'd always failed. So I did business in GCSEs and then in college and then a little part of my degree. Um, I'd, and I'd always found the business studies came very easy to me. I found that a very simple thing, simple thing to grasp. I, I enjoyed it and I found it easy. They were where I got my highest marks. Um, you know, my degree, my, the majority of my degree mark was because I did so well in business and I'd actually fight quite hard on the English side, um, probably because of the northerness. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> the subtitles of it. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. Put on. Um, so, and I think, I don't know if it was because of that, that I'd always had this very big general notion of I want to run my own business someday. And I always thought at some point down the line, I'll figure out what that business will be in and then I'll do it. I kind of, I know I want to run a business. I just don't know what it'll be. And it was just that, you know, at some point, eventually in the future, I will. Um, in the meantime, I'll go and do this finance thing. And I think I'd got to the point where my, the job that I was in, I was still living power planning. I wasn't enjoying working there. I was absolutely fed up with the travel. Um, and I don't know, I guess the idea just kind of came to my head. And then once it does, it's quite hard to get rid of it. So, well, I like doing this. I want to run my own business. Could my business be doing this? Is that kind of the, the opportunity for them to come together? Um, and obviously it's a, it's a big leap and there's kind of all the risks and everything that go with it. But I think 
I think knowing that I wanted to run my own business and then having built up a skill set in financial services, I could kind of combine the two and yeah, give it a go. Give it a go. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think um, it's interesting you said in the back of your mind, you've always kind of had a burning desire to run your own company and that when you've worked that out, that you'll get stuck into it and actually do it. I was a bit like that. I was similar in the back of my mind. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I always thought that I was going to run my own business. I didn't quite know yeah. when or where or how, but I knew that if an opportunity came up to do it, then I would, that, that was, that was what I wanted to do. So I think some people just have that burning desire inside them to want to, to own something. And um, I think there is a, a natural creative inside of you or an entrepreneur, as they would say, that, that um, you know, it's, it's an itch that needs to be scratched. And when the opportunity yeah. comes up, you, you sort of jump, jump on it. But I think, um, right. am, I, am I right to sort of assume that when you did set up um, your first business, which we'll go on to now, um, did you... Um, did you find there was a, you know, a huge amount of, of competition or anybody out there that was offering the same services to you? Because your first business that you set up is Parasols, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, Parasols yeah. is an outsourced power planning solution for financial advisors. How long ago was that you set it up? It was 2009, June 2009. 2009. So, 11 so 11 years ago. So 11 years ago, um, I mean, power planning roles weren't really out there you know they're not 11 years ago I, I wasn't I wasn't recruiting for power planning positions yeah so you must have seen some kind of gap in the market for power planning support is that correct just just give us a sort of an idea about how that came about you know why did you decide then that outsourced power planning was 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 the right route for you and how did you test the market to know that it um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't organised enough to test the market. <laughs> I just did what I do with everything and just dive in feet first and then figure out how to swim. Um, but there was a couple of outsourced power planning companies that were already out there. Um, so Richard Allen, who has, um, it's called the Power Planners now, it was um, Power Plan Plus at the time, I think. Um, his firm was already in existence, quite new. Um, and I think there was another one as well. So I'd kind of seen, oh, you know, there's people that are out there and they are working as a power planner and essentially freelance was the way I looked at it. I wasn't, wasn't even thinking about being a company or taking on staff or any of that. Um, I just saw that people had found a way to, to be a power planner, but without being full-time employed by somebody. Um, and actually, and I've mentioned this many times over the years, Richard, bearing in mind that technically I was competition, couldn't have been more helpful, more supportive you know, told me his experience, what he'd done, what had worked well, what hadn't worked well, gave me advice on pricing, um, you know, how to start, kind of start, things to start thinking about and processes. And um, because he very much recognised, even before I did, that, you know, it, it wasn't that I was competition, it's that I was another person that was going to actually help push forward the point of a power planner and why you might want to use one. And that in itself would then just kind of create more advisors that wanted power planners, which would then open up the market to all of us. So sort of stimulate the market um, a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, he was a massive help with that. Um, and, yeah, my, my thinking at the time was, why don't I... So we just, obviously, 2009, just come through the recession. And what I'd initially started doing was thinking, okay, I, I want to power plan. Um, I don't want to commute. So I was ringing around advice firms that were closer to my home, so back up in Darlington, County Durham, um, and just saying, I'm a power planner, I've got my diploma, I'm working on my charters, do you have any roles? And what they were saying over and over is, um, I'd like some power planning support. Absolutely, I can't hire right now. You know, we're, we're kind of in the middle of a recession. This isn't the time for me to be taken on a full-time employee. Um, so I think it was kind of a bit of a mix of that, of seeing that other people can do it. And then, you know, kind of going back to those advisors and saying, okay, well, what if I could come and just work for you as you need it and just on an hourly rate? Would, would that be something that you'd consider? And they were like, yeah, yeah, maybe. You know, that, that would be more kind of appealing than trying to take on an employee right now um and i guess that was the point where i thought okay well the only way to do this is to actually quit my job and to have a go to start speaking to these firms and just saying you know i'm here use me for an hour here and there and just whatever i could kind of get um which was yeah which is how i started but nothing as organized as testing the nothing market is organized. You, anything okay. like that now <laughs> yeah so you just so you you yourself you made the decision right you know i'm I'm, a, I'm, I'm working as a power planner at the moment i'm experienced in doing this um i've got a burning desire inside me to set up a business something drops and said okay well i could do my own business to, you know doing this the recession i remember you know absolutely set up my recruitment business during the recession the recession hit 
come out the back of that, people probably weren't in a position to be looking to hire people, but still needed some sort of power planning support. And you set the business up and started doing your own, I guess, marketing, if you like. You're going out to companies and speaking to them. Were you email marketing them? Were you phoning them up and selling them? You were cold calling people. Oh, my God. And you're not into that, that are you, at all? No. No? (laughs) I mean, I'm a power planner by nature. I am not into picking up the phone and speaking to people. So I am... Yeah, I basically, I just handed in my notice um, and I already had a mortgage at the time. So I, the car that I had, I sold my car um, and I got £4,000 for it. So I spent £1,000 on a car, a replacement car, which was a battered old Escort um, to kind of be able to get around, which left me £3,000, which back in the day, you could live on £1,000 a month. So my mortgage was £500 a month, left me another £500 a month for all my bills and food. Um, so my logic was great. I've got £3,000. That gives me a three month buffer um, plus my car. And, you know, I've got, I've got three months to kind of make this work. And um, yeah, initially there was kind of, um, there was little sort of grants and funding that was available at the time. So I got something like £350 to build a website, which was, you can imagine the quality of website that you get for £350. It was mm-hmm. that. Um, this logo that was built that was horrid. Um, and, you know, pulling an idea of services together and putting them in, like, in a Word document and then PDF and it in. Just trawling the FCA register, started emailing around, um, and then at some point thought, you know, I'm going to have to bite the bullet, I'm going to have to pick up the phone and speak to people. Um, tasked myself with making 10 phone calls a day, hated every second of it. That, for me, <laughs> by a long shot, was the worst bit. I absolutely so, despised it. So you definitely couldn't be a financial advisor. I mean, business development. Definitely couldn't be, no. Financial advice. <laughs> no. So there we go. If someone's okay, listening to yeah. this and they don't like the idea of picking up the telephone and making f- telephone calls, um, power planning is definitely, you know, back office functions, power planning route is definitely the, um, the angle for you. All right. So, um, okay. So, you know, it wasn't some kind of like, I've got 15, 20 grand in the bank you know i've got some <laughs> some backer you know i can't set a business up unless i've got a load of money you just literally just thought you know i've got a few quid i've sold a few things you know downsized cars and all sorts of things just to make this to make this work you stepped outside of your comfort comfort zone trying to trying to win clients how, how long did it take you when you set up your outsourced power planning how long did it take you to win your first client um my first bit of work that I did was in the third month so I actually didn't get to invoice it until the fourth month so I, I completely ran out of money I you know I'd got to the point of I, I couldn't eat um literally couldn't feed myself I tried to do some waitressing on the side to be able to do that like to be able to eat um I was a terrible waitress I'm very clumsy so that yeah. didn't work um I had to get a repayment mortgage on my holiday I'd got to the point where I couldn't afford that anymore um you know it got to the point of my mum staying just go and get a job you know there's jobs out there just go and get a job this is this is awful to kind of watch um and then a lady called flora who um, was actually still a client until very recently when she retired um i one of the calls that i'd made wasn't to her but it was to another advisor who then spoken to her and said oh this girl i know who's um doing some freelance power planning work um i don't know if you want to speak to her so then flora messaged me and i'd spoken to her um and I did sort of three hours work for twenty five pound an hour. So my first month I invoiced seventy five quid. Um but you know it was invoice and I didn't fax it. Um I did. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I was modern enough then to email. Um but then Flora was happy, so she used me again the following month and she referred me to somebody else and you know, probably invoiced a couple of hundred quid the next month and um it just kind of started to build back up from there. So it was flipping hard and that's what I mean about almost you know going into it very naive yeah um without there was no buffer there was no plan there was just a this is something that I want to do and I feel is the right thing for me and um I guess just stubbornness once I'd kind of started it was you know I'm in it now I might as well just keep going keep going yeah and you're and, 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 and that's really you know it's really good to hear the honesty there because setting up a business is hard um, you know, uh, it, it is going to be difficult. And I think you have to expect within the first three, six, nine months that it's going to be really tough and you might not have uh, some income coming in. And especially if you have to step outside of your comfort zone to be able to generate those clients. Absolutely as well. What's really good to hear and, and see because it's, you know, referrals is a massive part of generating new clients, a massive part of building your business. I, I think, you know, if you do a really good job for somebody and sometimes you have to give that job away for free, you know, you have to kind of do something for somebody for free and yeah. um, what you put out, you tend to get back. 
um i yeah. definitely you know in, in 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 our game in recruitment during sort of sort of difficult times it's not unusual for us to be able to do really good deals and things with people to make life easier but they come back to you um so somebody setting up so you know a lesson okay so what was the lesson you learned then from you know your first if someone was coming to you now and saying kathy can you give me some advice about setting up my outsource power planning company based on your experience in your first year what would your advice be um i just i think if it's whether it's power planning or anything else if it's something that you're genuinely passionate about and like you say you're willing to go outside your comfort zone for it's you know it's not the glamour of running your own business it's you've got to it's got to be an itch that you really 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 want to scratch because there's going to be pain to go through and you know even once I got clients it wasn't plain sailing then it was well now I need to give up my life because I foolishly thought I'll go freelance and I'll be really flexible I'll have loads of time off I can work what hours I want I can take holidays and didn't have a life at all for two years like I, I was literally chained to my desk um but at no point would it have crossed my mind to not do it because it just felt the right thing for me I had and enthusiasm for the work, the actual power planning. I love power planning. Uh, you know, I, I've had to stop power planning now because the businesses have grown, but it was prized out of my hands because it is just something that I thoroughly enjoy doing. So I think if you want to go and start your own business and at the outset it's going to be you doing the doing, then it needs to be something that you will happily get up and do at five o'clock in the morning and do until midnight if you need to, because the chances are you will need to to kind of get it up and running. Um, but if that's the case, then absolutely go for it. Absolutely no reason not to. You're a massive advocate of marketing, aren't you? You know, you, you, you do well um, with your branding and your marketing. Do you think um, somebody should invest in that very early on in their new business or not? Um, I'm smiling because um, I wasn't. Um, so I, I, I was lucky in a lot of ways with Parasols because when I started it power planning wasn't really well known um then there was RDR you kind of come out the recession you come through RDR and at that point I kind of rode a bit of a wave where advisors were going right all of a sudden I've got all of this extra responsibility that I need to do I can't go and get business as easily as I could I need to spend more time in it I do need some support they start to understand the benefit of power planning and at the same time um, you know, technology started to advance. So where advisors previously, when I very first started, they were still saying, come and sit in my office. You know, they didn't want to work remotely. They wanted to have me there physically. Um, that started to change and the outsourcing model started to work better. So for years, I was very lucky. I did very little marketing. Once that kind of, once it kicked off, it, it went, I didn't have to do anything. I did eventually update my website um, and that was pretty much it. My challenge for a long time was actually getting the staff you know I had a huge amount of demand and I couldn't create the supply to meet it um a few years ago three and a bit years ago three years ago in January and um, I actually hired Natalie so she came in to do some marketing because at that point um she was working as a freelance consultant I knew Natalie from uni and um, I said oh come in you know I've never really got to grips with my marketing so come in and have a look at it then she came in and she sat down and said, right, okay, so, you know, talk me through your challenges, what's your problems? And I said, oh, you know, we've got too many clients. And she was like, oh, no, yeah, you don't need marketing. <laughs> Why am I here? This is madness. Um, so then what we did was got into, okay, well, what's the problems? How can you help? And then realized that it was the recruiting and that in the, in the previous couple of years, I'd taken on a couple of graduates and they'd worked out really well and they'd um, trained up. So actually Nat's first thing was to come in and help me formalize and create the grad scheme um once we did that we started to build up the supply then she could go right now we'll focus on marketing and has um absolutely transformed our marketing across the whole group um so again you know i guess it's business lessons isn't it you learn it with hindsight and if you're not riding if you're not lucky enough to roll the wave that i did with power planning growing then yes having some marketing at the outset would make a difference the only thing i would caution against is it's it's easy especially now you can get so many marketing tools you can use canva for design and use a website builder and build your own and make it look amazing um but actually people they'll be drawn in by the marketing but you need to have the depth behind it to actually deliver what you're promising and um, so i wouldn't go all out on marketing with the risk of people coming through the door and then it falling down because actually you haven't been there to build up the resource internally to actually deliver what you're promising um it's that whole kind of overpromise 
under promise over deliver um, yeah. and I think with marketing it's easy to kind of tip it the wrong way especially if you're really good at it so yes the marketing can definitely help but absolutely you know kind of get it there get the thing that you're going to be marketing built first before you really focus on that fabulous okay so you went from working in your back bedroom by the sounds of things at home you know eating beans on toast uh for a few months um then it worked then you started winning clients um and then at that point you thought right okay i need i i can make a business out of this i'm getting too many clients coming through my door i can now turn this into a business where i start to hire people um and grow um so talk me through that then so you decided to start because you you're a big advocate aren't you of hiring graduates as opposed to hiring experienced power planners is that correct um, yeah i am i am now um i did again what everybody probably does I, I thought you needed experience um i guess especially when you're a small business you hire at the point that you're feeling the pain you hire at the point that you just you know you've run out of hours in the day and you can't physically do any more yourself and because of that you end up looking for somebody who can hit the ground running because you're there you've already got the pain you haven't got the time to train them all um my first hire actually was Jo Campbell so she's um, again so with us now so she I, she and I worked together at the original firm the um, older school advice firm in Bishop Auckland and she was still there um, and again was feeling very frustrated was doing qualifications wanted to be a power planner was being held back even though this was a few years later um, and took a massive, massive risk to come and work with me. Initially, I was still in my living room. Um, I didn't oh, even right. have a spare bedroom. I worked in my living room. So I'd kind of said, you know, can you, can you come and work in my living room with me? Um, eventually, I, I took on a kind of a little two-person office. And that was the point that she came. And again, when she handed in a notice at that advice firm and said she was coming to work with me, um, there was a lot of, this won't work out. You know, you've thrown away a career here. You, you know, you, you've gone to work with a friend. And that's, that's not a viable business model. And um, you know, all the stuff that just helps drive you even more, to be honest. Um, so she came. So what was lucky with Jo was that she's smart and switched on and could learn. She already had the basics, but she wasn't already experienced because she couldn't get the experience to where she was. Um, but I knew that I could work well with her because we already knew each other really well. Um, and, you know, we were good friends. So she came in and kind of trained up with me and just essentially mirrored every single thing that I did. And, you know, we used to share a phone in the middle of the desk and we just kind of pass it backwards and forwards and clients rang, just like, yes, I'm just putting you through. And then, <laughs> um, but that was brilliant. High years after that, it took a long time to get right because exactly what I was saying, we'd get to the point of feeling the pain. We would need somebody. We would take on somebody that seemed experienced, that had power planner on their CV. And exactly as you said, um probably weren't a power planner and you know through no fault of their own they've gone through what i've gone through where their advice firm has gone yep yeah, yep yeah, you know i'll give you a pat on the head and give you a little pay rise and we'll call you a power planner now so and you don't know what you don't know especially if you're in just an advice firm if you're not part of the wider financial community you would think you're a power planner because you are in the context of where you are um and a few times i did that where i brought people in thinking great you know here you go you're a power planner there's a computer there's a pile of work get on and they couldn't do it um, just because they, their experience of power planning was so different. So we did eventually go down the grad route and that works now, but you know, it's again, a lot of difficult lessons learned along the way. Okay. So the different, yeah, because yeah, absolutely. So hiring a graduate against hiring somebody with experience has its, you know, has its, has its challenges. Um, do you find like an experienced power planner that's perhaps worked with one company or perhaps a couple of companies and work quite closely with with say a financial planner do they struggle in that outsourced model where you might have to manage multiple relationships with different personalities and different wants and needs um or is it all pretty simple and straightforward um it's not pretty simple and straightforward yeah i do think there's a struggle i'm just thinking of them um, then actually one of my next employees um had had kind of a couple that didn't work and then the next was the power planner that had been at the second firm the one in harrogate and um, so he left and joined us um and he was so intelligent such a good power planner so 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 smart and um, but exactly that had been in one firm had worked with these two advisors knew the clients knew the model you know they used the eccentric platform they used presswood um for the cash flow could just kind of do it in his sleep 
Um, he had Asperger's as well. So actually all of a sudden you go in, he has a wide range of clients. Everybody's doing things differently. Um, you're a phenomenal power planner, but you need to learn how to adapt yourself. You've got Asperger's as an extra level of challenge there for you. Um, you need to be able to build relationships with these advisors. You need to accept that some, you know, some of them are going to be really, really into the detail and they were all about where, you know, three decimal points others are not that bothered the more about kind of the colloquial nature of a suitability report and how that comes across to clients um so that was a steep learning curve for him but like i said for somebody who had challenges adapting anyway because of his asperger's and had come from that environment you know he he still managed and i think um more than managed i think it's the thing that can stop you from getting bored if you are very good at your job if you've done all the qualifications there is to do sitting in one firm and just kind of doing it day in day out day in day out you know at some point you'll lose that challenge but actually working on an outsourced basis um and getting to deal with so many different providers platforms clients advisors it's the thing that means you've still got that core of power planning that you love but the flexibility to actually just still give you a kick up the bum every day i think from the outside looking in and 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 obviously having a business myself that recruits for power planning roles different different types of power planning roles um the role of a, an outsourced power planner is is very different to an in-house power planner especially around client facing yep. um because you guys aren't sat in the office with the financial advisor that you're supporting, you can't perhaps go along to a, um, a client meeting. Now, not all financial planners like to bring their, you know, their power planners along to the meetings, but mm. what you're starting to see with some of the smaller, more boutique firms is that they're taking this kind of family office type approach and bringing in the multiple, you know, the multiple people within the business that can say, well, he's your power planner and this is what he does. And, you know, or she um, is going to talk about what they do and, and all that kind of stuff. So you're sort of taking, that's not happening. So if you're outsourcing, if someone's outsourcing their power planning to you, do you think that the firm is missing out on something there or, or, or not? Is that an objection that you come up against at all when you're trying to win a new client to, to, to use your services? It's never been an objection. Um, how so it, it's never been an objection and um, typically advisors will use us because um as a power planner sitting in on a client meeting is brilliant you know the work that you do as a power planner there'll be an extra level to it because you heard the client's own words you understand exactly what it is that they need and um, you'll approach that case and that file in such a different way as a business it's not necessarily the most efficient way you know power planners aren't cheap and actually mm. advisors aren't cheap and then you put two of them in a room together um, it's not always the most efficient. So the majority of the time when the advisors are outsourcing their power planning, they're looking at efficiencies, they're looking at kind of getting through all this work and they're quite happy for the relationship to be with the advisor. Um, having said that, you know, COVID's happened and as much as we don't want to kind of go and focus on it too much, one of the things that came off the back of it was that we'd said, well, okay, all of a sudden advisors are now meeting with their clients via Zoom. Um, they're not sitting in their office with them, they're not going to houses, they probably want quite some time. And if they're sitting in on Zoom, why don't we sit in on Zoom, you know, as their power planner, there's absolutely nothing stopping us. Um, you know, I can apply branding, which has the advice firm behind me. So to the client, I look just as much an employee of that advice firm. Um, and again, you then get in that full benefit stuff for the advisor instead of doing a Zoom call with their clients, coming back, doing the meeting notes, sending the case to Parasols, uploading all the information, telling us what they've discussed and doing it all back we can actually just sit in on the zoom we're there as a, a you know representative of the firm we're taking the meeting notes we're asking the questions as we go along if you know we know that we're going to need it from the clients you finish the zoom you have a quick debrief with the advisor and that advisor just goes off and forgets about it and you know we're there we've got the knowledge we know what's happening and you just pick it up um so i guess you know just like rdr changed the way everything's everything worked then i think COVID is and um the way that we're working with advice firms is already changing so um yeah that kind of relationship i think will continue to evolve i think the recording of client meetings is has got to be a benefit hasn't it to the industry i know that there are some the fca requirements now where where, where meetings are recorded and a lot of advisors, advisors used to be like i don't want to do that i don't want to record my meeting it's gonna make people feel really uncomfortable actually what you said there and i think what covid's definitely brought in is this more people are using Zoom, more people are using video chat. I love the fact of what you just said there, that you can also jump on their, on their meeting because it doesn't matter where you're based. You can just jump on their meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, you are an extension of their business 
if need be, you can sit on their website. You can sit on their team page as well. I'm sure you're oh, doing. I'm on so many advisor websites. I, yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I googled you. I said, I thought, if she's got more companies than she's letting on. But yeah, so you can you you can be that extension, can't you, of their team? They don't yeah. have to have somebody in in the office. And I think it is a highly competitive role. Power planning. It's very difficult for a firm of any size to really attract a power planner. They are constantly getting their heads turned because the salary keeps going up. I mean, you know, it's not unusual in London at the moment to get 55, 60 K for a chartered, you know, chartered power planner, you know, and, and, and that is turning people's heads. So the security of keeping that person in the job is, 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 you know, it is a risk, a risk to a company, you know, and I can see the benefit of outsourcing it to a power planning firm. I outsource a lot of the tools, a lot of the processes in my business. And what I love about it is you pay by the hour. You know, you pay for what you use. You don't have to yeah. worry about um, holiday pay, sickness, um, and anything else that really comes with hiring somebody, you know, um, the responsibilities of managing that person, for example. And I think um, if you're somebody that wants to focus on what you're doing, your, you know, the work that you're doing, and you don't want to have to turn your head and think, oh, God, I've got no business for that person to do. They're sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Yeah. This is costing me money. And you start to get resentful. I think the outsource model is, is perfect. And it's about just really over time building trust with that person. I mean, I outsource some stuff to India and it takes me time. It took me time to really really kind of build the relationship but now the relationship's in place it works beautifully yeah, exactly yeah you know, it works beautifully. and i think that's another another thing that covid will do so it's, it is that when you're outsourcing you need to build that relationship and um you know i used to always say to advisors don't you can't just outsource a problem you can't just think oh well, this doesn't work so i'll make it somebody else's problem it's still your business you mm. own that process you own that issue and um, you can use external results you can collaborate they can work together um, but you can't just go, well, here's a problem, you deal with it as an outsourcer, that won't work. But actually, if you work together and you do build that relationship, then absolutely it can work as well as having somebody in-house without, as you say, all the stuff around it. And I think another thing that's come off COVID is, again, people were just used to, including me, you know, we've got beautiful offices here. Um, we're different in parasols and that most other larger outsourced power planning companies, their team are scattered all around the country because they've always said you can do, you know, why not? Um, I've always said, no, actually, I, I want you all together. I like the way that people learn off each other. I like the way that do collaborate and we can do training. Um, and from the advisor's point of view, it's kind of, they've made that mental leap of outsourcing to us, but then they know we're here. We're kind of, we're not scattered around. So that always worked for us. And again, there's just something around, I like coming in the office and there's people here. Um, and I think most business owners, including advisors, were the same. But actually what, what's happened in the last few months is they've gone, all right, okay, well, my team are working from home. Um, it's worked just as well. They're fine. They do work from home. Why do I need to bring them in the office? And I think, again, that's just going to be another link that's severed with the, the difference between hiring and outsourcing. I and mean, when it's something as someone is difficult to find as a power planner, or someone as expensive as a power planner, and if the main reason you were going through the pain of hiring one was because you wanted them sat in your office and you're now thinking, actually, I don't need them in my office, then, you know, another benefit for parasols yeah. <laughs> i mean i didn't want covid obviously but yeah i think there's certain businesses and outsourcing one of them that um, not even just power planning outsourcing generally where people are going absolutely this can work i think what covid's definitely done is it's it's, it's made us sort of stand on our own two feet a little bit and take a look at the look at what we do as a business as a business owner and to look at areas where are we spending too much money and why you know is it you know are we are we employing that person because we are worried that if we don't have them our business won't you know achieve the levels that we hope for it to achieve is it a control thing and i think sometimes when you cut the apron strings and you let go yeah. and you trust somebody else to help you with your business from an outsource perspective and i think as long as I mean, echoing what you said as long as you communicate exactly what your business is about what what you how you like to work you know what you expect from the language used i suspect in say a report you get all that ironed out in the beginning then it just it's amazing how how quickly an outsourced person picks up your personality and how, how you come across um yeah and i think covid's allowing people to kind of take a look at that a little bit and um perhaps let go of some of the things that um they don't need to have anymore and outsource it so it and you need to build that relationship even when they're an employee it's still the mm. same you know an employee isn't going to come in and immediately know everything that you do or how you approach you would still invest that time in your employees so it works exactly the same 
My, my concern um, at the moment is, I think everybody was like, oh, brilliant, you know, COVID-19, yes, we can all work from home and, you know, uh, you know finally that work-life balance things happened. But I think COVID-19 is a bit of a tricky one because some people have been working from home in, you know, and, and under lockdown. Somebody had been working from yeah. home with their children. So they're trying to yeah. teach their children, you know, and that is, it's been proper stressful, you know, yeah. and um, I don't think it's a true representation of what really flexible working actually is anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm a big advocate of flexible working and I want to bring it in and I think it's a trust thing. And I think what, you know, again, a benefit of what COVID-19, you know, benefit, but something good that's come off mm. the back of it is that it's allowed us to trust our employees a bit more. Um, and if somebody wants to do well and have that flexibility, they, they, they will do well and have, have that flexibility. But um, I think, the, the, and I like what you're doing really, because it's, it's, it, it sort of echoes what I do as well, which where, you know, we could have recruitment consultants all spread out across the UK. Yeah. But we don't, we choose to have them all in, 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 in the office. Now for that yeah. is to build a culture as well. Yeah. And that's the bit I think that if you have too many people working from home, you don't have that office. How are you going to create culture? in a business that's spread out, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, you know, and everyone's working from home. So I think that's very difficult. And I think it's quite refreshing if you are an outsourced business to, and, and you, this is what you guys obviously pride yourself on is having everybody in that office space. They can come and go. Yes. You can work from home, have that flexibility, but you're building a culture and you're building a business and they feel part of something. And I think that's, yeah. Im, I do think that's import, important. You know, I don't think we're going to lose that. And all of a sudden everyone's going to yeah. go, don't need office space anymore. I think people are going to cut down on their office space. All of a sudden the office that you thought, could house 40 people could house 80 people because you've got some you know you got people working from home etc so i think there's some certainly some benefits from there now you obviously had a really great success from parasols then so you outsource you know you, you built an outsource power planning company from working from your you know your front room hiring your staff in your front room you've then got yourself an office now you've moved into some you know really beautiful offices um you've hired how many people work in under parasol now how many guys have you got working 30 for? 30, 30 people that's amazing so how long did it take you to reach 30 30 um 30 staff under parasols mm, do you know what i don't know because we um because it started to blur because we ended up with apricity so then some people moved from parasols to apricity yeah. um so that was the compliance company that we launched three years ago um, and then last year launched Data Finance, which is the training academy. So again, some people moved across. So across the group, there's just over 40 people now. Um, but yeah, they've kind of, um, I guess it's one of the exciting things actually for people is that you, they've, some have come in and they might have come in as a power planner or they might have come in as a grad and they've trained up, they've done their admin, they've done power planning, they've got the qualifications. Um, and being part of the Verve group, they've then been able to try different things. So they've, you know, tried um, compliance. Holly's just moved across to Art of Finance. She's actually now taken all that power planning knowledge and building um, training courses for other power planners as part of the Art of Finance. Um, so, yeah, it's quite transitional. People have kind of moved across to different businesses. Okay, cool. So, absolutely. So, you, so just so the listeners to understand, so you, you own the Verve group, yeah? So yeah. underneath the Verve group, you've got Apricity, and we're yep. going to go on to that now, which is compliance, outsource yep. compliance. You've got Parasols, which we've just talked about, which is your outsource power planning company. You've got 30 people working yep. in, un, under that at the moment. Um, that sounds like um, you know, a fantastic business. And you've also set up the Art of Finance, which is a training and development um, company. Um, sort of out, so say financial planning firms or financial services firms can use your services to train their, to, to train their staff. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Excellent. So Parasol set up, that's all up and running. Fantastic. And then you had the idea of setting up Apricity, which is the outsourced compliance. So why is there a need for outsourced compliance? Um, so with Apricity, what happened was I um, had my little boy. I was on maternity leave um, because I have issues and I'm easily bored. I was bored on maternity leave. I was thinking about what challenges I had in Parasols. And at the time, the main challenge that we had was the advisor would use us as their power planners. We would do some work, we'd send it back, the advisor would be happy, the client would be happy. At some point, they would get a final check done by either internal compliance or they were already using outsourced compliance. Um, that compliance would generally be a very negative experience. It'd be very nitpicky on the file and trying to find things wrong. And it would mean that the compliance then fed back to the advisor who fed back to us, we'd make the changes, it'd go back to the advisor, it'd go back to the compliance. And while I was sat there with um, a newborn who sleeps a lot, so, you know, 
that was the mistake I made. I was like, oh, this child thing's easy. They just sleep all the time. I'll, I'll come up with a new business. Um, and I was sat thinking what my pain points were in parasols. It was this whole, you know, the, the initial process, the dealing with the advisor, the initial power pattern was absolutely fine. We'd nailed it. It was working brilliantly. It was the mess that came once compliance got involved in this sort of triangle that happened. It wasn't efficient for the advisor. They were then dealing with two separate parties. Um, so I'd started to think, you know, can, can compliance not be done a bit better? Um, it feels like a very negative thing. It feels like a necessary evil to a lot of firms, but actually, you know, if it's necessary, then why, why is it evil? Why, is, why are we not all working on the same page? Compliance advisor, power partner to just make sure the client gets the best possible experience and the best advice for them. Um, and I also at that time thought it's a very manual process. Everything is done with a compliance professional going and sitting in an ad advisor's office, blocking out a day, going through their files. Um, you know, how were we at this point? It was 2016. How were we not using technology to do some of this? Um, so that's where Pristy came from. It came from the desire to just improve the way that all the different parties worked together. Um, compliance being a big block for a lot of people and, and to use technology. Um, so I came back from maternity leave when my little one was three months old and just kind of got straight in the office and um, got Rory Percival in who just left the FCA and um, got some external compliance consultants to say okay as power planners this is what we'd love from compliance as the FCA what do they want to see as existing compliance consultants you know what's the reality you you know the day-to-day -day challenges what does that look like um, and then use that to just kind of with a, a blank piece of paper so completely different to my experience with starting parasol where I just saw a bit in with the Pristy who actually thought it through <laughs> did some research did some planning yeah. and, and then came up with it okay fantastic so again there so there was a need for outsource compliance because you know what what makes a pricity then say different from um simply biz what makes them different um, say, from simply biz for example so i guess the main thing i get when you're looking at any any provider in financial services like Simply Bears, like some of the back office systems, they were all born pre-RDR. So what they've done is evolved over the years, but there's a huge amount of legacy culture, systems, processes, the way things work from, from the olden days, from how things used to be. Um, and with the Pricity, that wasn't the case. We very much went, okay, what, this is what finance looks like right now. What do we think finance is gonna look like? Let's not build it even for, certainly not for the past, not even for what we have. Um, you know, we're seeing older advisors retiring. We're seeing a new generation of advisors coming through. We're seeing younger people coming in. Are they going to think it's normal that they have to block out an entire Friday one, you know, once a month for somebody to come and sit and check that they've done their CPD or look at their files? Of course not. They're just going to think this is insane. They, they, you know, they're going to want to just be able to deal with it on an app. You know, you know the way that we work and the way that it's happening. Um, is just it was just very backwards looking so i guess the difference with the pricity was we immediately went okay well here's the tech not immediately i wildly underestimated how long it takes to build technology um this was in the november so my little boy was born in august in november i was back i was like great here's the idea let's launch it in january and um, actually took a full year to build the system so i was absolutely clueless on it um but then we said okay the, you know the current advisors are still used to a very human hand-holding approach with their compliance so what you've got is the core of the technology and we'll wrap the human support around it but even that we'll do differently we won't come in and say we're compliance and we're here to tell you what we'll say we're compliance and we're here to help you to de-risk your firm to give your clients a great experience to you know take away the pain um i'd said at the beginning that i don't want to be an advisor because the regulatory challenges and that's awful you know that that puts me off advising i'm sure it puts plenty of people off advising um so with the pristy we wanted to do that we didn't want to be there to say well we're going to scare monger you into paying for our services um you know a, a good a pristy experience would mean that you don't need us anymore because actually what we've done is really helped you embed such good culture and business practices that you, you know you're not concerned about compliance we, we've kind of done it and you use your tech to check in on it um Again, we, we were looking to the future, COVID's come along, and actually what it's done is made advisors go, well, actually, I need to embrace this technology much faster than I thought I was going to have to. I can't rely on my compliance guy coming and sitting in my office. This, you know, the future's kind of arrived a lot sooner. So, um, yeah, we, again, not happy COVID happened, but have managed to take some positives from it, and that it's, it's pushed forward that future that we were building for. At the same time, you know, it's saving people time, isn't it? 
you know, it's streamlining their businesses and their processes. As you said, you know, someone coming into the industry, I don't think anybody right now really wants to book out a whole day for compliance, do they? Um, it's a pretty uncomfortable um, situation uh, to be in. And, um, and I think as well with, with compliance, you know, it's, it's always been deemed as a bit of a, an evil, isn't it really? Not an evil, mm-hmm. but a kind of, a, you're yeah, stopping yeah. me from writing business. Yeah. And I think prevention that, unit. Absolutely, a prevention unit and, and, and rightfully so in some situations yeah. to be able to protect, protect the customer and the consumer. Now, you, so you, you're obviously an advocate of technology because you're talking about that there. You spent a year to build a technology that um, supports Abricity and the clients that you work with. Can you just sort of tell me a little bit about how your technology within your business works and how it benefits the clients that you work with, with a, on, on, under Abricity? Um, yes, so under Apricity, it's um, so briefly with parasols, we actually built some tech in parasols as well. Um, once we had a few power planners and quite a few clients, it was not easy to manage it. And obviously, outsourced power planning didn't really exist, so there was no outsourced power planning tools on the market. You just had to take like an existing project management system and try and kind of shoehorn it into what we were doing. Um, so that didn't work, so we actually had our own system built on parasols. Um, which is ready for a refresh now, um, but gave me my first experience of saying, and, and that was built completely different to a It didn't take a year to build it, literally took a few weeks. It was so simple. It's kind of evolved since then. Um, but it gave me my first experience of going for my business to work well, for me to be able to deliver the service that I'm promising, there needs to be something in between us and the advisor. It can't just be this kind of manual, you know, whether it's emails or cloud services or whatever. Um, so with Apricity, it was a case of, I could then say, okay, on Parasols, we built some software. It's, it's become a bit of a Frankenstein over the years. It, it does what we wanted it to do, but I never, at the outset, it was a very simple tool and it's built up from there. I don't want to do that with Apricity. I want to try and think ahead and think what this will end up looking like and build it now, which is why it took so long. Um, so I guess the aim of Apricity for the advisors is that you don't have dozens of files and calendar reminders and appointments for every single part of compliance in your firm, whether it's you know doing your training and competency checks with your advisors or their CPD or renewing your PI, doing your annual testing, making sure their GDPR is up to date, their whistleblowing, absolutely everything. There's, you know, people are managing it with spreadsheets and files and task lists. And actually what it is is a piece of technology that just you plug all your advisors in and it just runs. So you know at any point if, um, if there's a breach, if people aren't passing their file checks, if people's SPS isn't up to date, whatever it might be, the system will actually alert you. So it's not waiting until you've got the time to physically sit down and look through something. It's kind of proactively checking that everything's up to date and working constantly. So then that just takes a big chunk away from you. So you can focus on the stuff that you really need to do, which is, you know, your business, your clients, updating your processes, just making sure that it works. Um, so that's the aim of it. There's still, as I'm finding with technology, you, you know, you do it and you've got, this is brilliant. And then a day later, you just go, right, yeah, no, there's so much more I want to do. You can just keep going and going and going. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the initial philosophy. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So, you know, that was born off the back of parasols, really. You saw a need there for better compliance, a better support function. And I suppose as well, one hand kind of washes the other with that. You know, if you've got your uh, power planners supporting, um, supporting firms in respect of their power planning, um, surely it's a nice, easy way to then um, sort of start talking about compliance and then bringing it all under one roof, really, isn't it? And, and, and one yeah. place uh, instead of having to go here, there and everywhere for it. And um, internally then, when you, when you hire into both of these companies, so Pricity and, um, and Parasols, you mentioned that you predominantly have taken on, say, graduates um, in the past and then training those graduates up. Across those two businesses, how many of the staff that, that work underneath those two businesses have actually come through the graduate scheme as opposed to, say, coming directly from um, a, a company where they they have experience? Um, I think at the last count, there's about 22 would come through the grad scheme. So, um, yeah, a little over half. Yeah, I mean, it's there is still um, need for experience at times. So obviously in Apricity, when we started, as much as I felt the frustrations of compliance and as much as I had power planning knowledge and new advice firms and so on, um, I'd never worked in compliance. So my initial hire there had to be somebody with that expertise. Um, we can then bring in graduates and then you've got experience. So there's kind of two main guys in Apricity. Um, one of them actually was an advisor, which 
really mattered to me because he came in going, I've sat there as an advisor and had a really negative experience with compliance. So I'll make sure that I'm not doing that. I'm not just bringing traditional compliance that I'll then replicate. Um, and the other guy's a huge amount of compliance experience, but is just a pristine through and through. It absolutely hates the way that it has been done and the negativity of it. Um, so once you've got them in place, then you can bring the grads in because then you've got experience and you can create that training framework. And we've recently, so all the tech that we built in the past, we outsourced. Um, and because there's so much that we want to do with technology, we've brought that internal. And again, my initial hire is um, a good quality, well-experienced software developer. And when we next open the grad scheme, we'll bring in junior, you know, graduate developers because now I've got that experience for somebody to bring them in and train them off. My, my preference is to hire based on values that you were talking about culture. You just can't replicate it. You know, you can teach people in terms of power planning. I can teach people power plan, um, but their values need to align with the company and with software or my first um, compliance hires. That's the hard bit because I can't hire based just on values. I do have to rely on their experience because I need them to build it up. But once you've got that in place, um, yeah, it's brilliant. You can bring people in, you can train them, they learn your way. You know that you've got a good personality fit and you've got people with the right kind of resources to be able to do that. Fantastic. So you're a big, big advocate then of taking on grads uh, over experience as long as you, you know, rightfully bring somebody in with a bit, bit of experience, somebody who can kind of head it up. And then hopefully that person then can become a mentor or a, a guide, a trainer to um, the less experienced guys, but who have the right attributes to to, to make it in apricity or parasols. Yeah. So grad, you know, the grad scheme for you has worked is, has worked really really well. Um, yeah, a lot of companies in financial planning, um, especially financial planning, do seem to struggle with taking on a graduate. They want experience over anything. You know, you know they have to have two years experience or they have to have level four diploma. You know, I come across some amazing some amazing guys who've got such really you know the right attributes that would make it say as a financial planner for example but they're just getting told that you know oh no you can't yeah. you can't join us because you haven't got the experience but yet the industry really, how do you get the experience yeah yeah and yet the industry is really really struggling to attract younger people to to it and they wonder why in in, in, in mm. wise. um so it's amazing to see a company that's investing so heavily in the graduate side of things and um I assume as well, these guys come to you. You're not having to spend a huge amount of money on recruitment fees or, or anything along those lines because, you know, it's, um, you know, when you're attracting grads, it's, it's far easier and more cost effective, isn't it, to, to hire these guys? It is. And we honestly, I still don't know how it happened, but we um, decided to call it the grad scheme, keep it mm. simple. And somehow it must have just been a stroke of luck. The URL, www.thegradscheme.co.uk was available. Wow. For like £20. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can only assume some bigger company had it at some point and they let it go and we have them find it. But it means that when you Google a grad scheme, you know, we literally have the domain name for it. So quite quickly, we kind of put a simple website up. Um, you know, your challenge then was the first role we were recruiting for through the grad scheme as a power planner. So your immediate challenge is, even if grads come along to it, they're going to say, well, what's a power planner? Why do I want to do that? So we had to be really sort of tongue in cheek with our sort of messaging around it and, explaining what a power planner was but then where we got to pre-covid was that we were bringing in two cohorts a year so april and october we were running them um and we were getting sort of literally it was just there on the website and we would do the occasional mail around some unis and from that we were getting sort of 120 applicants for each cohort so um yeah really really minimal costs once it was like up and running once it was up and running. Fantastic. So, you know, that obviously then you, you're hiring all these grads. A lot of training needs to be done with, with graduates. You know, there is training, there is development, there is mentorship that needs to be done. Did that then spark the art of finance? Was that why you set up the art of finance based on your experience of training and developing people without any experience of financial services? It did. Yeah, exactly. So I'd always wanted to launch Power Planner Academy. Um, I think Training them is fine, um, is part of it. But exactly as I said, attracting people to a power planner role in the first place, because nobody's ever heard of it, is a massive challenge. Um, so I thought if there was an academy that was specifically for that, you'd get the role out there as a power planner. People might hear about it. They might actually actively choose to take it as a career rather than falling into it. And then you would have an academy to train them through. Um, Nat had the idea of saying, well, actually, you know, there's a general gap in financial services, not just power, you're feeling the power planning gap because you are one or were one, um, but it's across the whole of finance. So that's where the art of finance came from. So that's kind of early days um, in terms of the bigger mission piece. It's working practically. We do training. We've got um, 
we train people on administration, power planning, compliance, and we put them through their diploma alongside it, but with the aim of giving them practical skills. So again, as an advisor, yes, your power planner can do their diploma through the CII, but who's taught them what a good suitability report looks like, how to do research, how to use the platform, and um, what cash flow planning looks like, all of these. So we give them the practical skills on it, but then the bigger mission piece around that finance is to start getting the um, career path of financial services. The roles are available outside of, of finance and actually getting a hell of a lot more people applying, not just to us into the grad scheme, but to the whole of financial services. Fantastic. So yeah, creating that kind of um, clear career path, if you like, outline exactly what it is. Um, educate those that don't understand, say, the, the, the different routes of employment within financial services. You're starting off in power planning and what you know, financial planning, um, and building training programs around that, and even getting them all up to level level four qualifications, but also building what they need to know and experience within the job, what they need to understand, not just the qualifications and what's you know what's on paper. Um, so yeah, really- it's not just the actual financial advice role. So even, you know, look at yourself, you, yeah. you're in recruitment, but in financial services, and there's almost, when you do a role, you know, if you're in marketing, but in financial services, you could be the best marketer in the world, but you need to understand the nuances of finance. You need to understand the regulation that applies to it. Um, you know, you as a recruiter, you need to understand the different roles and, you know, the challenges around power planning and what, what a power planner actually is that you can challenge back on a CV. So I think, one of the things that we're doing is saying actually even a career in finance there's more than just admin power planner advisor you could want to be a journalist but work in financial services um you know that absolutely any career path but almost with that finance wraparound then it's just bringing more and more people into the industry and understanding that there's a lot more options there for them very interesting so for example if i hire say five graduates into my business and i wanted to say look you know i'm going to give you some real top-notch training around what power planner does what a financial planner does you know the industry itself as a, as a whole nuances compliance what part that plays in it that's something that perhaps even myself as a business that's a recruitment in financial services i don't have yeah. to be yeah that's that's really interesting yeah. i'd like to well i'd certainly like to hear a little bit more around I'll that sign so. you up <laughs> sign me up yeah get a discount right? you get a discount don't I? Well, yeah. <laughs> 50% well, we're off literally at the building, um, <laughs> It is right now, actually, I was thinking. Um, yeah, we're literally building the art of financial marketing for that reason. So, like I say, you could be the best marketer in the world, but actually you need to know the regulations around it. Um, you know, you need to know kind of the restrictions that apply to advisors and the way that things work. So there's, you know, right back where I was saying, even just as an administrator, you can't, you couldn't be an admin outside of finance and then assume that you can do the same role. There's so yeah. much more around it. So it's, it's that generally, it's breaking down. It's just popping that financial services bubble. I just think we're in a massive bubble and it's very, we want more people in it, but then we're just as bad at actually not helping to pop it and not kind of breaking down those boundaries. Yeah. It's, it, it, what do you think of the image of um, the external image of financial services? What's your, you know, what's your view on the external image of financial services to someone looking? I in? think it's, it's, to be honest, I think for the most part, it is still what it was pre RDR. Like we know how phenomenal the change has been and um, we know how much evolution there still is it's why i love finance it's why i'm still in it because it's not stale it actually is rapidly evolving um we launched our podcast that meant podcast um when did we launch it beginning of this year and so last year we did a bit of general i'm saying market research we were in the pub um, and we were just asking people obviously we were just asking people in the pub you know at the next table at the bar in the good old days of pubs um, what do you think of when you hear financial services, when you think of financial services? And it was exactly what you'd expect. Rip off, um, scams. These were kind of the words that were still coming out. People just, same as me back when I was 20, 21. Um, somebody says financial services, you just go, I, I don't know. And the only thing you can grasp at is anything that's kind of been a headline. And unfortunately, you know, bad news makes headlines. So I do think the external perception is still you know, a decade behind what the industry is actually like. And I think that's a big challenge that we all need to play our part in and actually changing that. So what are you doing to change um, the perception of financial services then? Um, so the, the Verve Group came about because um, by last year, there was the three businesses, the Power of Solidarity and the Art of Finance. And I wanted a way to kind of pull all of those together to have a consistent message. And Verve Group has two visions. Um, so one is to support good quality financial advice firms. So that's through doing their power planning, their admin, their compliance, helping them, you know, helping them grow, helping those business owners to really develop and thrive and 
um, you know, train their staff and get them, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger because that'll just push the industry out. But then the second part of the Verve Group's overall vision is is to pop this bubble and is to start to get out there and let more people realise how good financial services is, either as a career, because I genuinely think there's amazing career options, um, or to not be afraid to go and get financial advice. There is so much that's kind of overwhelming around it and daunting um, that people, you know, they leave it until far too late to get advice. I think it's not something for them. They haven't received an inheritance, so why would they need it? Um, so with the art of finance, we're pushing on the career side and get more people involved and trying to have this fresh, funky, different image, which like I say is early days, there's loads we want to do. Um, and actually breaking down the misconceptions around getting financial advice is what the podcast is for. So that means the podcast is Joe and I, um, you know, with financial service experience, but really going, you know, we're not traditional, we're not middle-aged men in suits, we are too generally drunk and I'm appreciating that there's a theme that keeps coming up, but we're two generally slightly tipsy girls um, who do work in finance and actually look at this, let's talk about mortgage or let's talk about pension and let's make you realise it's maybe not as scary. Um, so a long, long, long way to go, but something that we're really, really passionate about at Verve. Fantastic. What I'm getting, the vibe that I'm getting from the Verve group, okay, is, a, you know, very forward thinking, very much interested in simplifying the processes and um, making it easier for financial planning firms or financial services firms to run their compliance or, or, or run their power planning. Big emphasis on training and mentoring staff. You aren't all about having somebody with the top notch experience. You will take on a graduate and you will bring them in and you know that your training, your development, your mentorship will get them to the levels that they need to. You want to pass on that experience as well and of what you've um, achieved in setting up your business because you have achieved. It sounds like an, an amazing business. I mean, from working from your front room to now having how many staff have you got now? 40. 40 staff. I mean, that's amazing. So, you know, you're an outsourced company here that's looking at, it's got 40 staff and you're running compliance, you're running power planning, you're, you're stepped into the training development side of things and that's coming, you know, that's kicking off. Not only that, but you're looking at marketing, helping support marketing for people as well. So you're becoming this one-stop shop for the financial planning industry. Um, you know, and I think it sounds, you know, like a really forward-thinking interesting company and i love the fact that you've brought out the, the mint podcast as well the mint podcast is all about as you said a couple of girls having a drink you're not middle-aged men you know talking about the ins and outs of a bond or anything like that you're just talking normal language to somebody who might not have a great understanding as to what a mortgage is or how debt works or what a financial planner really does and you're bringing that piece in again to educate people about the realities of financial planning. Um, yeah. And at the same time, why perhaps they might be interested in a career in it, that it's not boring. It's not stuffy. It's actually very forward thinking. I mean, a lot of these tech companies, FinTech companies, there's so much yeah. happening in finance. It's a very, very interesting time to get into it. Um, but I think it's just, as you said, perception from others is that you are well, scam this or scam that, you know, you're all a bunch of crooks and you know, um, that will naturally change. And I think younger people as well sometimes overlook finance for something a little bit sexier. They don't consider um, finance industry to be sexy. But what we're seeing more now, and I, what I love is I'm, when I, especially within my sort of bubble, which is bubble, which is financial planning, you're starting to see way more, and mainly women actually, um, stepping up and talking about behavioral psychology and, yeah. you know, the behavior science and why you might you know, what fears do you have around money? I'm really starting to explore the kind of um, health and well-being aspects of what managing your money can do for your future and how great you can make you feel. I mean, that there's a lady called Catherine Morgan, actually, who's got a podcast called In Her Financial Shoes. Um, I think, you know, she's doing really good things from a marketing perspective and a personal brand perspective to be able to bridge yeah. that gap between um, how we think about money. Um, and there's lots of others that are coming up and doing that as well. And I think anything that can do that is, um, is an absolute Brucey bonus in, in my eyes. What does, um, what, what do you think the future holds for you guys then? Cause obviously you've, you, you know, you're doing really well by the sounds of things, but what does the future hold for the Verve group? Where are you, where are you going to take it, Kathy? Oh, who knows? <laughs> um, I mean, I never thought I would take it to where it is. So, um, I'm, you probably gathered I'm not one for overly planning things. I very much go with what feels right. I tend to find um, either gaps or um, 
itches that need scratching and kind of go at them I think like I say with with the overall mission of the verb we've, we've just started and um, there is so much there I think until the point that I really genuinely feel like I I can create a group of companies and people within those companies that can have an impact on financial services and it's not going to be overnight you know it might be sort of 10 15 20 years before you really genuinely see I quite intentionally call finance an industry still because it is still but I know that there's a, a lot of people that are really pushing towards making it a profession and I mm. think um, we will get there eventually a big thing in Verve Group is to um, and one of the things that we're going to be kind of pushing over the coming year in particular is to say to all of these firms that have, you've all got the same frustrations you all want to see um, finance developing you want to leave kind of the bad old days behind us you want to get new people in um, it's time to you know almost put your money where your mouth is like what are you actually doing what you know the firms that are still saying um, I only want to take people on if they're already qualified and experienced. Well, you're not helping. We can help you. Let's give you a framework. Let's find you some graduates. Let's give you some training courses. You know, let me actually give you, because that's what puts a lot of um, firms off, bringing in graduates. They haven't got the structure. I didn't have the structure. It took a long time to build it and then to get it right. Um, but actually, if I can give you the structure, get some of these new people in, start having these conversations, because it was all talking about the problem, but then still doing the same old thing isn't going to change it. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be the focus for Verve Group for a while and um, ultimately it might expand outside of the UK as well. Oh, fantastic. Plans. Thinking about it. <laughs> well, why not? You know, it's um, so many firms nowadays go international. Um, we're international, you know, we recruit, we recruit in the UAE, we recruit in Hong Kong. Um, we've started doing, um, working with a fintech company in the USA. So okay. yeah, so, I, you know, the world is absolutely your oyster and i think um you know why and not similar challenges with financial services wherever wherever you are in the world you're generally at different points of this sort of rdr regulatory journey but actually they're all going through them they've either been through what we've gone through or about to. Yeah. so actually we're, we're in quite a good position to be able to help them with that do you know what america is a really big market for financial advice i mean it's like 400 yeah, no, it's got trump <laughs> he's got trump yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's like, when I looked at it, there's like 400,000 financial advisors over there. There's, 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 there's loads of financial advisors in comparison to anywhere else in the world. And what, you know, yeah. um, but you know, so to look at, isn't it? Amazing. So yeah, great stuff. Well, um, thank you for your, right? your time today. You know, thank you for sharing um, your career um, to date. Obviously we could talk for hours about that, but I think you've given us a really good insight into really how you started out, which was, you know, leaving university, struggling to find a job, selling yourself to get into that job, starting at grassroots level as an administrator, working your way up and, and sort of understanding the role of what a power planner was, making the decision that you wanted to become a power planner because you really did know that you weren't a salesperson. You weren't somebody that wanted to go out and win clients and sit down with them and you were driven by targets and all of those typical types of things and money, et cetera. You were more around the, 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 the supporting functions and how to improve the experience perhaps for the clients and the security of the company that you were working with. Went off and... Um, had a, a you know a burning desire yourself really to, to to run your own business set yourself up as an external power planning company at home and um you know found it very hard for the first three to six months you know very close to perhaps giving up or someone giving you some advice to give up i think it was your mum wasn't it saying you know why are you doing this go get a proper job but you know you stuck at it and um you know the realities of it is when you run your own business, regardless of whether or not it's a supporting function, you're going to have to do some sales calls, aren't you? And that's what yeah. you had to roll your sleeves up, get, you know, get your hands dirty and make some sales calls. And that's exactly what happened. But once you did it for one person and did a deal with one person, then another one, then another one, the referral systems work, you built up a, you know, you took on somebody, built up a company now that's got 40 people. You've moved from outsourced power planning into outsourced compliance, into outsourced training. You're becoming this one stop, one stop shop for the financial planning industry. Um, and you're a massive advocate of graduate hiring and 80% of your staff have come through the graduate scheme. Um, I mean, that's a huge amount of success. And I think a, an excellent role model for any other financial planning uh, company or financial services company that are um, looking, to grow, looking to grow their team. And um, without a shadow of a doubt, they should be checking you out to help improve their processes and um, get some advice on definitely how to do it on an internal, on an internal well, external basis. That kind of gives yeah, me an angle. But um, no, real, thank you. <laughs> real, real pleasure talking to you. And um, thank you. and um, take care. And maybe get me on your Mint podcast. 
Ask me you some know questions. what? I actually will. Yeah, I'll sign you up for your courses first, and then I'll get you on that mini. Yeah, I got, to, got to spend <laughs> some money first. Though, right? But I'm definitely interested in those courses because they they sound quite they're quite interesting. So definitely want to talk about that. So um, brilliant. Have a lovely day, Kathy, and thank you so much thank for your time you. today. Take care. Cheers. You too. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Bye.